All right, last but not least, let's talk about anti-patterns. I already mentioned the basic idea. These are actually quite similar to the design patterns. They are widely used and pretty straightforward solutions to problems that occur again and again. However, anti-patterns are solutions that will inevitably cause problems later on, just like the code smells. So they're uh, very common code smells, basically. And I've listed a few very common ones here and would like to discuss them briefly. Here's also a, a long list of other anti-patterns, but the ones I'm, I'm listing here are probably uh, some of the most common ones. Probably the biggest uh, anti-pattern at all is the string without length. And that means that you uh, store a, a string of text, for example, in memory without knowing the explicit length. And rather you use a so, uh, some kind of marker. Um, almost all issues with this uh, anti-pattern come from the standard C library. And here the marker is a null byte. So you insert a, a zero byte, which isn't valid text at the end of the string. And um, that just tells you that uh, you can process the string up to a certain point, And when you reach the end, then the, the, current, the current byte will be null basically. Um, and sometimes this is actually used for other types of arrays too. Uh, one big problem with this is of course that whenever you do something with the string, you can't know the length uh, ahead of time. So you would actually, for example, if you want to create a copy, then you wouldn't actually need to walk through the entire array until you find the marker and only then you know that you can stop copying. Um, if you know the length up front, then you can just copy the whole thing in one block, for example. Um, so this is one issue regarding uh, performance, but there's also a, a big security issue because if you somehow manage to override this marker, then you can often uh, extend the array beyond its actual, uh, its its official limit, so to say, and override other bits of, uh, of the code, for example, the stack um, without the program actually noticing. So probably half of uh, all security issues of the last uh, 30, 40 years have been caused by uh, basically this pattern, I, I would say. Um, the proper solution which uh, Java uses, which C++ actually uses, is to just uh, have an additional int uh, for uh, for the string class, which stores the length. And uh, for a bit of bookkeeping, you need to, of course, to store the maximum length, but a lot of issues are avoided if you do not have this, uh, this redundant marker byte. Um, because, uh, for example, you can also always need to account for this marker byte. So if you want to be able to store a string of 100 characters, then your array actually needs to be 101 characters long because you still need space for that marker byte. And if you, uh, uh, if you miscalculate that, then you can basically again overrun the end of the array accidentally and run into all sorts of uh, bugs and security issues. So this is a really common an anti-pattern and one that definitely sh should be avoided. Um, a completely different anti-pattern is related to when you want to extract data from the web. Um, and what a lot of people actually uh, do when they want to do a quick of dirty prototype, quick and dirty prototype is to use some kind of regular expression search to just parse the data from the HTML of the page. Um, and this may work for five minutes and maybe even for, for uh, five weeks or something. But uh, if the, the page which you're pulling the data from is changed at all, then uh, your regular expression will probably break and will either just not find anything or will uh, return garbage. In many cases, you will still have to, to um, clean up uh, remaining HTML tags from the result and so on. Um, so the proper solution in almost all cases is to actually use a uh, kind of machine readable data source that, uh, for example, returns JSON or XML or something that is actually designed to be parsed by a machine. If you don't have that, if you 
just have a web page, then it's still not a good idea to use regular expressions. There's all sorts of libraries that will actually properly parse the uh, the XML which the page consists of, and um, that will make it a lot easier to go to to one specific part of the page and extract the data from there, as opposed to just using a, a regular expression search, which is really very, very failure prone as soon as any bit of the page has changed at all. All right, so um, another very common anti-pattern is called zero means null. Um, the idea here is that you have uh, a field that holds an integer or a string or something and you want to, to represent that this field doesn't actually contain any valid data. And uh, what the anti-pattern basically does is that you use zero, so the value null, for example, for an integer or the um, uh, actually the value null for a string, for example, to represent the zero pointer, which means that it's empty. Um, and that means whenever you want to give that field a value, a proper value, which by whatever coincidence is zero, then um, you can't do that because the software will inter interpret that as, as not having a value. So uh, sometimes uh, people have, there are actually people who have the name null um, and they actually have a lot of problems in, in today's uh, information society because there's lots of, uh, there's lots of software which uh, passes the string null into a zero value or a non-value. And so they, uh, in 50% of cases, they just can't enter their name anywhere. Um, Sometimes people also use uh, minus one negative values to, to represent values, but if you don't take care of that, then you might uh, actually get get overflow errors because minus one can also be, be interpreted as, uh, as the maximum integer. And then you uh, can interpret that if you're not careful as having a lot more data uh, when in fact you don't have any data at all. Um, so this is usually something that invites problems again down the road and the the solution that's usually recommended is that you either ha just have a boolean flag that tells you okay this field is valid or not or if you for example in java you have a, an actual pointer to to a string object or in c++ then you can set that pointer to null and that it, then it actually means that there is no data available or you can have a valid pointer and then whatever is in the string is actually the valid data. So this is one uh, proper solution for this problem uh, as opposed to just putting a zero value into uh, the data field itself. Another um, anti-pattern that's related to, to financial applications especially is that if you want to store a specific amount of money, then it's very uh, straightforward and obvious to use something like a float or double and then 1.23 uh, would mean 1 euro 23 cents. Problem is, however, um, this is something we already mentioned briefly, that uh, a decimal fraction like 1 euro 23 cents is not something that uh, is absolutely 100% accurately uh, representable in a binary number. Because when you store this float uh, on, in, in, your, in memory on your machine, then it will, of course, be converted to a binary number. And then you will always get a tiny rounding error. And this may not be apparent at first, but if you perform lots of operations, lots of calculations with these uh, amounts of money, then these rounding errors can actually accumulate over time. And that is then at some point might actually be a problem uh, if you then suddenly have more or less money than you're supposed to have on your account. Um, that's usually not a good thing. Um, there's more or less one possible solution. Both of these are basically just two sides of the same coin. Either you use so-called fixed point math where you don't have a floating uh, uh, decimal point, but rather a fixed de decimal point. So it's clear that there will always be two uh, decimal numbers after, after the dot, for example. 
or you just use two separate integers, one for the euros and one for the cents, for example. So um, this is actually related. A similar bug uh, is one we discussed in the very first lecture, which was this uh, Patriot missile disaster, where also um, values consisting of one hundredth of a second were added up in a floating point uh, uh, variable. But um, if you repeatedly add one hundredth, then uh, because this is not accurately representable too, then you will get rounding errors and at some point there was an offset of the few seconds that was enough for the system to miss an incoming missile. So uh, these rounding errors are also something to, to keep in mind if you're dealing with uh, per percentages and uh, fractions of 100 and so on, so decimal fractions, because they will simply not be 100% accurate in the binary representation that the uh, computer internally uses. Another very common anti-pattern, the last one for today, is the so-called exception funnel. Um, the idea here is that you want to handle exceptions, but not uh, basically dump all sorts of stack traces on the user. And the solution is often that you just introduce some kind of, of catch-all block like this that doesn't really handle the exception. Uh, it just catches the exception and discards it and continues. Um, Problems with this is, of course, that you will never get any suitable debug output, so you will never see what's actually happening when an exception occurs. And um, if you don't handle the errors in here properly and just throw the exception away, then the program might continue to run for a bit, but then it will uh, probably uh, run into some other issue that's been caused by not properly handling the exception. And uh, for that reason, it's usually a much better idea to actually use descriptive exceptions like uh, null pointer exception, of course, or a floating point exception, divide by zero exception, whatever you have, and actually uh, use separate catch blocks for uh, the exceptions to actually be, a be able to um, handle each error individually uh, in the best possible way and not just uh, dump them all into into this this funnel basically and into the trash bin. All right, so much for code quality. Um, if there are any questions, once again, feel, please feel free to, to comment on the Moodle discussion board and see you soon.